Now I can't see anybody. <laughs> but I can see my notes. <laughs> uh, Rick asked me to give a little testimony before I start. So I was born in Kansas, so I consider myself a Kansas girl. And when I was like, uh, we lived in Superior, Nebraska then. My dad was uh, farmed, but that didn't work out because the crops were so bad for a few years. So he became a truck driver. So that's what he did for a living. And we lived in uh, Superior, Nebraska. And then when I was in middle school, then we moved to, uh, actually I went to three schools in three states in three months. And that was, uh, I think I was, I think I was seventh grade actually, because when the, the junior high, so we went from Superior, Nebraska to Alton, Illinois to St. Charles, Missouri. So and that was kind of rough on us at that age. And I had, uh, I had never seen a black person until I was in the uh, seventh grade. So, and the, so that was quite an experience at school too for us. But we had never been raised to have any prejudice or anything. So that wasn't an issue that way for us. And then we, um, then they, my dad was transferred to Salt Lake City, Utah. And uh, when we lived in Utah then, um, I was dating another truck driver's son. And I got pregnant at 16 and had my beautiful Angie at 17. And we got married. Um, then I was in, uh, went from there to North Carolina. And we split up and I uh, married another serviceman. Um, and had my other two children in Fayetteville, North Carolina. So, uh, and from there I came back and my parents were then in Washington. So then we were out here. And we, we were raised Lutheran. So I knew some things of God. I had head knowledge of God. I knew, and, and I'd gone through the classes, and then we could take, if you go through the classes for two years, then you can take communion. So I had that head knowledge. And, so then, uh, but it didn't really impact my life or doing the things that I wanted to do. So, so I was pretty self-centered and went through a lot of struggles um, and stuff. And I wouldn't consider myself that I was that great a mom. I mean, I love my kids, but I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't very good that way. <laughs> But, I, uh, but then I had this, my brother invited me to church, and so I went to this church, and it was a kind of a wild Pentecostal church, and, and I, I got convicted, and I told my brother to stop praying for me, and, uh, and I got so convicted, so I went back and had this encounter with God, where he really touched me and began to do that work in my life of healing that I needed very much insecurity and and no self-esteem and just guilt just guilt and guilt and fear and he began to do that work at that little church and it was in a, a little church in South Center and I must say I've never been the same after that experience I've never been the same and I know it was God it was God doing His work and loving me in such a beautiful way. And I knew then that I felt like He was uh, calling me and said to go to Kansas. And I had, I mean, great faith and I believed Him and trusted Him. And so, because I knew who I was in Christ, and we're going to talk about that a little later more, because of that I, I stepped out in faith and began to look for a job there. And I went back and, and applied for some jobs, and then I came back out here, and I sent in resume, and I was hired for a job over the phone, sight unseen. And my mom kept saying to me, they're going to move you out there, they're going to move you out there. And I was like, really? But I hadn't understood what he said the name of the company was. It was McCormick Payton Moving and Storage. And they hired me over the phone, sight unseen, and they moved me out there. So I got a little apartment there, and um, and one daughter stayed here, 
and my son was with my mom and dad for a little while, and one daughter was with me, and we had a, a little apartment, and God woke me up at noon one day, and he said, go, I want you to go look at mobile homes, and it's like, I got up, and got dressed, and went and looked at mobile homes, and I stepped in one, and I knew that was it, that it was the one that I was to have, but I said to them, I'm only going to take this if I get to put it, I'm, I want this one, but I'm only going to take it if I can put it where I want, and I wanted Farmer's Avenue. And Farmer's Avenue was in a great big mobile home park of over 400 mobile homes. And I know that I was seventh on the waiting list, but I knew that God would do that for me, that I, that I could have that. And so I'm driving back from lunch one day, and God spoke to me very clearly. Because I knew I was standing in faith, and I knew, and I trusted him for that. He said, how selfish of you to impact all the, those lives to get what you want. And I, I got so, I said, okay, God, I'll take the lot you have open. And I lived in that mobile home for two weeks, and a tornado went through. This was in Andover, Kansas. And that tornado took out that whole mobile home park. There was nothing left on Farm Avenue. There was nothing left in that entire mobile home park. It wiped out over 400 mobile homes. And I still had mine. And it was fun. I went without electricity for a few days, but I still had that brand new mobile home, that gift from God. And I knew when I got that, that there was a family that lived behind in a mobile home. And I knew that they would get it when I was done. And so I was there three years, and I was done, and ready to, oh, I, I had a breakdown. I had a really bad breakdown while I was in Kansas, and was in the hospital for two weeks, a mental breakdown. And my mother had said from the time I was little that I had mental problems, and I was like, you know, and it's like, I felt like she spoke that over me, and that God took care of that. When I had the breakdown, I spent two weeks in the hospital. God did the wonderful healing. It was part of that healing process of Him working those things in my life. I wrote out my life, and I signed it off to God, and the enemy never comes at me with those things anymore, of the guilt and, and things that I carried. It's like it was gone as far as the East is from the West. And so out of that, and I didn't end up on antidepressants, which was a miracle of God as far as I'm concerned because I mean I started and I said I don't like them I told the doctor I had I don't like them he goes I said what are they for he goes to make you sleep better can you believe that and I said I sleep better than anybody in here the night nurses don't even know me and he, I said I don't want to take them he said okay I mean it was like God you're so good it was so good in that and when I came out of that hospital from that breakdown I was I've never struggled with those mental problems again. Never struggled with thinking about taking my life or thinking that I wasn't worth anything. God worked such a work in me in that experience that I did just have never been. He, he's work in my life. I've not been the same. I know who I am in Him, and, and He's mine, and I'm His. And that's that's kind of how that ended up from that experience. So I decided I wasn't going to have my oldest daughter out here have babies and me not be there. Because I knew that as a woman of God, a grandma, I had something to impart to my grandchildren. So I got ready to come back out here. And I went to that neighbor and I said, you ready to move in? He said, okay. And so we packed up and drove out here. And, and, and Angie got, got me a place. And, uh, and so... Then I started going to, I met Curtis, went downtown, I met Curtis, 18 years ago. So, and that's my testimony. <laughs> it's like the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Okay, so we're going to talk today about Jesus. And I, you were listening to a song on the way here, and it was about the sweetness of Jesus. You just can't go wrong with Jesus. And we've been doing a study, kind of the doctrine notes of GCI, and we talked about how he was a physical mortal being, and how he needed to eat, and he needed to sustain himself, and he went through the same things that we go through. He had feelings and struggles and things, but he never sinned. But he was human, just like us. And he also had the authority of God. And he also had, was God. And so, 
as the Son of God, and he was able to work miracles and know things in his life and do that, that walk and that work that he was to do. And then there was the five facts about Jesus. Jesus had shared in God's glory, and then others, it's appropriate for people to worship Jesus. That one's coming up. And Jesus is truly human and truly divine, showing us what God is like and what humanity should be. So today we're going to talk about, the title said, who, do he, who did he think he was? And I was really, had to ponder that for a while. Who did he think he was? He didn't think, he knew who he was. But along with that, who do we think we are? And do we know who we are? And working that out. He had a clear sense of his identity. He had a clear sense of identity from the time he was young. Uh, it talks about his first experience at 12 when he had that special relationship with his father in heaven. And I could help but think, what do 12 year old boys care about? I mean, how many 12 year old boys do you know that, that their main concern would be when they go to, to temple and for a celebration and a feast? that they would want to spend their time in there talking to other religious leaders and men. I, I don't know many 12-year-olds, but he did. And his, what did he say? He said, I must be about my father's business. My favorite prayer for young people. God, put that must to be about the father's business. Lord, they must be about your business. It's that time, that hour we live in. They must. They must. And Jesus knew he must be about his father's business. And I thought about that too. It's like, Lord, they must desire to be about your business. That there would be that, that burning and that wanting to in them to want to be about your business. I think that Jesus knew who he was even younger than that. Because I've been in places where there was a three-year-old one time in Kansas at a prayer meeting I went to. There was a three-year-old that started praying. And it stopped everything in the room, this three-year-old praying, with this pure heart and such fever and sincerity in her. And it, 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 there was tears in every eye. But she was aware. And it's like the book Heaven is for Real, where this little boy is, is touched and goes to heaven and, and he shares those experiences just purely, clearly, it's the truth, and that, you know, and that's just how it was, just so assured. And I can't help but think that Jesus had to have been that way, knowing who Papa God was all along. When I was eight, I I had a wonderful time this week going down memory lane of the stones, you know, the stones of remembrances of the things of God where he was here in your life and where he was there in your life. And when I was eight, we were on a farm, uncle's farm, and there was a hill, and I can remember going up there, because we always went to Sunday school, you know, you had your Sunday school stories, and I can remember standing up on that knoll just preaching and <laughs> talking about Jesus from that. And it's like, God, I never knowing, not really realizing that God is so, and he will, he'll just do that for the young. That's why I can't wait to go to camp and just pray. So and then the next time he was at his baptism was another time where he was touched. And the Holy Spirit descended on him. This is Luke 3.22. The Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven. You are my son, whom I love, and with you, I am well pleased. It's like, and we're to hear that. Well done, good and faithful servant, when we go home to be with the Lord. But you know, do you ever feel like God has talked to you or said something to you to impact you that way here? I was thinking about that. It's like, I went in the prayer room and we lived in the church downtown one time and I spent an hour singing those old hymns. Rick played some of them yesterday in Tacoma. It was just beautiful. Those old hymns, singing those songs to God. And I went to walk out of the prayer room after just crying and weeping and pouring it out to him. And I heard him say so clearly to me, thank you. A puddle for days. 
And I've had several times when it's puddled for days because he spoke to me or he did something. And, and if you haven't experienced that, you need to ask him. It's like, God, just ask him. The best word, I, there was a sermon one time by a gentleman at, when we lived downtown and he said, if you're not sure how to handle that situation, just ask God. He'll tell you. He's God. He's big enough. He's great enough. I mean, he speaks to us in different ways. Sometimes people hear him in an audible voice. Sometimes just kind of Holy Spirit in your mind. You realize that he said that. Or, but help us be in tune with that, too. And it's like and sometimes through his word, he just opens the windows and you can just that clear understanding of what he's saying. Jesus, too, he had a, newly had a mission to perform. He came to preach the kingdom of God. He came to love us and model that pattern for us, to show us a better glimpse of the Father, our Father. He was his God, he's our God, and our God, too. He was the Son of God, he was the Christ, the Messiah, the person uniquely anointed by God for a special mission. And we are all anointed by God for a special mission. And I don't want to miss mine. I don't want to miss out on anything he has that designed for me to do. Jesus didn't. He came to die. He came to rise again. He knew the timing, too. Every step of the way, he knew the timing. Remember, there's several times he said, it's not time yet. It's not my time yet. And it's like, I want to be aware enough on God. Is it time? Is this my time? I don't want to go before. I don't want to go too late. I want it to be his timing and to be clearly focused. I want it on that narrow path where not the left or not the right, but right there in the middle doing what he has for me to do and, and being clearly hearing from him to know that timing and know the mission that I need to perform to do what's before me. He also took time away to go and be away with the Father. In knowing what he needed to do, I think he needed to go and get strengthened or go and hear that word or go and not be distracted by things of the world and other people. And I think we need to be aware of that and make sure that we do that sometimes to go rest. And I, I know there's a song with fly away and find rest in him. And it's like I want to fly away and find rest in him when I need it, when I'm feeling weary or down, down or it's all too much. Who, what, who was he? He proclaimed himself to be the basis of the new covenant, a new relationship with God. He saw himself as the focal point of what God was doing in the world. Well, he was the focal point of what God was doing in the world. When he was born, it changed time. And he still is the focal point. But you know, we are too, as Christians, as believers, as God's children. We're the focal point of what's going on in the world. Because I believe the believers determine what happens in a country and the outcome of everything. I truly believe that. It isn't, it isn't just this way or that way because God's in charge and God's big and large and totally in charge. So it's, I mean, we're the ones that determine by what we do or do not do. We determine what happens in a country. That's why it's so added. We pray for our leaders. We're to do that. Uh, who was he? Uh, he? He was one that knew himself. He was strong enough. He spoke against the traditions and the laws of the time, against the temple, the religious leaders, where they were in error. And he spoke with the authority of God because he had that authority. And, you know, we have an authority, too, that he's given us as believers in him, his authority. We can speak in his authority. And I, I'm going to read what my notes were because it just hit me this morning. In these times where right, the things of God that are right, are considered wrong, and the wrong things of the world are considered okay to do, do we have the ability, as Jesus did, to speak against them? In wisdom and in love, not condemning. And I think if we're plugged into the power source, and we walk in that uncondemning love, we can, when he says so, when we're doing it in his time. We can say what he tells us to say and do what he tells us to do with no fear. 
Even, even the martyrs. I mean, how many are martyred? Because they stand and they do it with no fear. Doing like Jesus did. Having that authority, speaking what's right. He demanded that his followers abandon everything to follow him, to put him first in their lives, to give him complete allegiance. He still demands that of us today. With such an all-consuming love, giving us that ability to do it. We can tap into his power and his authority to do just like Jesus did. The better things, more things, greater things than he did. And you, you hear that. I do anyway. I have about raisings from the dead where God and healings of people. That is, that's there. It's there for us. We have access to those greater things than these. Oh, uh, he, if, you're, if you belong to him, he's at work in your life. If you belong to him, he's at work into your life. I think that whenever I did wrong, and it's not like I didn't do some wrong after he moved on me, it was like there wasn't an enjoyment in it. And there was always his, the wooing of the Holy Spirit to come back to, come back to him where he's, where he's showing and leading and guiding and telling you. He was the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. He was the Messiah that was born in Bethlehem, that was prophesied in the Old Testament. He was born of a virgin. It said that he'd be born of a virgin. The Old Testament said he's a prophet like Moses. He was to enter Jerusalem in triumph and he, on the donkey. And it even said that he'd come enter Jerusalem on a donkey in the Old Testament. He was to be rejected by his own people. He was to be betrayed by one of his followers. He was to be tried and condemned. He was to be silent before his accusers. And he was. All these are things that they said it in the Old Testament because the, the Bible was all about Jesus anyway. It's that love story. He was to be struck and spat on by his enemies. He was to be mocked and insulted, to die by crucifixion, to suffer with criminals and pray for his enemies. And he knew he was the fulfillment of all these. He knew that. To be given sour wine, he knew that it said in there that in uh, Psalms how you, they were going to throw dice for his clothes, how his bones wouldn't be broken. He was to die as a sacrifice for sin. He is to be raised from the dead. And it says in the Old Testament how he's now God's right hand. And he was the son of man who would be given all power and authority. I'm going to read Isaiah 53 out of the message, which is one of the prophecies of Jesus. The servant grew up before God, a scrawny seedling, a scrubby plant in a parched field, there was nothing attractive about him, nothing to cause us to take a second look. He was looked down on and passed over, a man who suffered, who knew pain firsthand. One look at him and people turned away. We looked down on him, thought he was scum. But the fact is, it was our pains he carried, our disfigurements, all the things wrong with us. We thought he brought it on himself, that God was punishing him for his own failures. But it was our sins that did that to him, that ripped and tore and crushed him. Our sins. He took the punishment and that made us whole. Through his bruises we get healed. We're all like sheep who've wandered off and gotten lost. We've all done our own thing, gone our own way. And God has piled all our sins, everything we've done wrong, on him. On him. He was beaten, he was tortured, but he didn't say a word. Like a lamb taken to be slaughtered and like a sheep being sheared, he took it all in silence. Justice miscarried, and he was led off. And did anyone really know what was happening? He died without a thought for his own welfare, brute, beaten, bloody for the sins of my people. They buried him with the wicked, threw him in a grave with the rich man, 
even though he'd never heard a soul or said one word that wasn't true. Still, it's what God had in mind all along to crush him with pain. The plan was that he'd give himself as an offering for sin so that he'd see life come from it, life, life, and more life. And God's plan will deeply prosper through him. Out of that terrible travail of soul, he'll see that it's worth it and be glad he did it. Through what he experienced, my righteous one, my servant, will make many righteous ones, and he himself carries the burden of their sins. Therefore, I'll reward him extravagantly, the best of everything, the highest honors, because he looked death in the face and didn't flinch. Because he embraced the company of the lowest, he took on his shoulders the sin of the many. He took up the cause of all the black sheep. I was the black sheep in our family. I can tell you that. And he took it for me. For me. Who did he think he was? Let's see what he said about South and John. He said, I'm the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I'm the door of the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the way and the truth and the life. I'm the true vine and I am not alone. Who are we then? We're children of God. We can trust Papa God because of who Jesus is. Because of the price he paid. Because he took my sins. We're loved, accepted, forgiven. And that doesn't mean smooth sailing. But we are safe in his arms. And I just love my Jesus. And I am so thankful for my Jesus.